This is episode 79 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast, How to Prevent Sepsis in Georgia Nursing Homes. The Nursing Home Abuse Podcast is dedicated to providing news and information for families whose loved ones have been injured in a nursing home. Here are your hosts, Georgia attorneys Rob Shank and Will Smith. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Rob Shank. And I'm Will Smith. We got some very interesting information, important information um, for you today on this episode um, concerning sepsis, um, what sepsis is, how to prevent it, and what to look out for with your loved one in a nursing home. Sepsis can be extremely dangerous. In our experience, a lot of our clients... Yeah, it's, uh, it, it can be a death sentence, yeah, unfortunately. It can be a, yeah, a death sentence. But um, you, we're not alone in discussing this, um, this important issue. Today, we have a guest. Um, I would say that it's our second medical doctor that we've had on. In, since the inception of the podcast, yeah, uh, July has been a month of of uh, medical doctors. Of medical doctors. We've had two on so far. Docs. Um, our guest today is Dr. Imrana Malik. She is the Global Sepsis Alliance Advance Coordinator, and will tell us a little bit more about her. I will. Um, she is an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Care at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, which is one of the foremost institutions in the world um, for um, uh, cancer research. And, and Dr. Malik is primarily involved in direct patient care in the medical and surgical intensive care units. Her clinical research and quality improvement interests include sepsis in cancer patients. At uh, MD Anderson, Dr. Malik is chair of the Institutional uh, Sepsis Advisory Committee which seeks to improve outcomes for cancer patients with sepsis. Dr. Malik is also the chair of the Texas Medical Center, or TMC, Sepsis Collaborative, which is the multi-institutional collaboration with a mission to connect, collaborate, and galvanize the um, Texas Med Medical Center institutions in adult and pediatric septic care, research, and outcomes. Dr. Malik also serves as a member of the Global Sepsis Alliance, GSA. Additionally, she is coordinator for the GSA Advanced Program, which is a coalition of sepsis experts and supporters around the world who help advance GSA's uh, mission. So we are very privileged to have somebody with this, um, this pedigree on the show today to talk about um, the condition of sepsis. All right, Dr. Malik, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Um, so, Dr. Malik, um, we, we have you on today um, to give basically a 40,000 foot view of um, the infection sepsis. Um, I know that a lot of our clients uh, that come in the door, their loved one has um, is either battling or has succumbed to sepsis. So um, we know that you have a lot of experience with this, experience treating it, preventing it. Can you just walk our listener um, through the basics of sepsis, what it is, um, how is why it caused? Why it's so dangerous. And why is yeah. it so dangerous? Absolutely, absolutely. I think one of the first things I want to impart, and it's probably something that is going to be a surprise for many um, listeners, is that sepsis is the number one cause of death from infections and is preventable. So that um, tells you very distinctly how significant the problem is. Um, in terms of how it occurs, sepsis occurs when the body's response becomes an unchecked response to infection and then leads to severe damage, as, including tissues and organs, um, and leads to what's called multi-organ dysfunction. It's commonly caused by infections that may be bacterial in origin, but vi viruses can also cause them, as well as fungi, too. So we really need to be very careful and watchful when it comes to sepsis because it can come from many different sources. Is there a source that is more common than others? Well, it um, depends on you know your the setting in terms of the patient's comorbidities. It it depends on the age of the individual, infants versus the elderly, etc. Um, so, but in general, um, any age. 
um, any underlying comorbidity can succumb to infection from either bacterial or viruses. Or fungi. It just depends on how you get infected, whether it's from because of a cut or because of something you ingested or just depends on whether you have a, a wound that, that becomes um, infected secondarily. So it just depends on w- what the setting is. And, and can you explain to us, uh, is every infection lead to sepsis um, or, or, or how does an infection lead to sepsis and one doesn't lead to, to sepsis? That's a very good question. So not all infections lead to sepsis. However, all infections have the potential to. So when you have an infection, when it is allowed to propagate and progress to the point where it can become bloodstream born and then go to different parts of the body and become so overwhelming that the body, as it's trying to fight it, starts doing its own collateral damage that's what sepsis is when it's so overwhelming when it's so uh um when it starts involving so many organs now the body's in trouble because now we've moved on to sepsis but not every infection will do that if we are careful if we're monitoring for those infections if we're um, treating them early if we're taking care of potential sources of infection it may not progress to the point of sepsis but certainly all infections have the possibility of progressing the sepsis. You mentioned earlier um, in terms of the mechanism for uh, the, the sepsis being caused as with comorbidities being involved in that. Is that a reason why um, sepsis is, is more dangerous or more, more likely to occur in the elderly population versus just the average adult population? Absolutely. Um, so as you may assume that um, elderly patients have a lot more comorbidities. They've had many more years of prolonged comorbidities. And in general, the elderly population tends to have um, a lower immune system just because of their age, but also because of whatever other comorbid conditions they may have um, confounding all of that. So absolutely, the comorbidities are, are definitely a component of what happens in terms of the prognosis for these patients as well as the outcomes for these patients um so from a from a health standpoint then for an an average um uh resident of a nursing home that's of advanced age okay um what would be the symptoms or the signs um that perhaps there there is a sepsis um there's an issue with sepsis with that individual like it is it um loss of consciousness is it like uh, you know the skin is infected that kind of thing what are we what what should the family sure. look out look out for right the common signs of sepsis are confusion so lowered lowered mental alertness fevers chills uh, rapid breathing or rapid heart rate, lower blood pressure, nausea, vomiting, um, and more importantly in the elderly, confusion and low mental alertness is often the first sign of sepsis. And even more interestingly, when an older person becomes septic, fever is often absent for those individuals. So one has to be a lot more vigilant in the elderly than in those who are just average age um, patients because they may present a little bit differently. They may just be not as alert as they normally have been as their baseline, and they may not present with that fever. So you really have to be very vigilant. What's the What's the reason why there's no fever with, with sepsis, or there may not be a fever with sepsis? Um, so it, it really is what your immune system is able to mount. So as you're older... Uh, or if you have other reasons why your immune system isn't very strong, such as underlying cancers or cancer therapies, et cetera, your immune system is trying to battle an infection, but it's not able to mount enough of a fever or enough of a, uh, enough of those signs to tell you that there's something going on in the body. And so, hence, in those patients, fever can be absent. Um, we we hear a lot in in some of our cases, and just to let you know, the vast majority of the times in our cases, uh, we get residents who get uh, sepsis through bed sores, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes they'll they'll undergo what's called septic shock. Can you explain to us what septic shock is? Absolutely. So, in terms of the progression, so there's infection. 
where somehow an organism such as bacteria, virus, or fungi have entered into the body and have started either at the level of the skin or soft tissue or further in have started to take hold. That's infection. Sepsis is when it has had a chance to get further into the body, into the bloodstream, into other organs, and started causing havoc there. Right. Septic shock is that in those individuals where sepsis has started, they have started having lower blood pressure. And on top of that, as they've been resuscitated with fluids to help with their blood pressure, they become refractory to that treatment, that septic shock. So in, in your experience, um, Dr. Malik, how long from the general, um, we'll just keep using the bed sore, for example, um, how long from the infection to reaching septic shock is that are you talking about a matter of hours a couple days a week um, is there a general you know how, how long is it what's the window the family has to recognize the symptoms and get something done before septic shock sets in right and i think that that can vary depending on what kind of comorbidities that patient has mm -hmm. however once it's gotten into the bloodstream once it's made its way to being sepsis Moving on to septic shock can be a matter of hours. Um, I would say no more than days where things are going to move really quickly. So when someone has sepsis, that is our point at which we really need to get that treatment early because now we're talking short, short period of time, hours, where this can actually progress to low blood pressure and then low blood pressure that does not respond to further therapy. So it's really um, pertinent and important that when we identify sepsis, we are immediately thinking about getting care and appropriate treatment right away. Sure. Um, so uh, again, a lot of our clients, the, the, um, the mechanism for sepsis is either a bed sore or possibly UTI. Um, is there basically from a health standpoint, is there a reason why those are the catalysts for the sepsis versus just maybe like a cut on the elbow or, or, or some, some other um, ailment? I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that um, unlike a cut on your arm where you can see it and be aware of it, bed sores may not be getting the right kind of attention. So they're not being evaluated or they're, it's, it's hard to notice when they've progressed or worsened until it's a little bit too late. Similarly for a UTI, you can't really tell if someone is having um, a, U, a, a very obvious UTI unless they're telling you about their signs of those. And sometimes nursing home residents may not be able to explain the signs that they're having in terms of urinary pain, um, but they also may not show fevers. So it's those are things that are harder to find, harder to diagnose. And so that leads into delay in identification. And the delay in ident identification leads into delays in treatment. So those are the reasons why those tend to be um, common. But they're also commonly found in older individuals who are in nursing homes. I see. Um and so can you uh, walk us through what happens to the body when it goes from sepsis or severe sepsis into septic shock? What's literally going on with the organs and the bloodstream, that kind of thing? Sure, sure. So when you're progressing into septic shock, that means that the body, body's organs have now been overwhelmed and the, the functions are not able to maintain appropriate um, care for that patient. So, for instance, um, we may have blood pressure that is so low um, and so refractory to resuscitation that it's not perfusing the brain well, so the patient is less responsive. Um, it's not perfusing the kidneys well. The kidneys are not making urine. They're not clearing toxins out of the body. Those toxins, like um, the acid level in your body, um, worsens the blood pressure, becomes a cyclical cycle. Um, there's less blood pressure and flow to the heart, so you may actually have not only demand-related um, heart symptoms um, or what we call demand ischemia or basically um, a 
similar to a heart attack, but because of the low blood pressure. You can also have low heart function related to the profound sepsis and septic shock that's going on. You can also have the liver that's overwhelmed and is not able to clear the toxins that the liver normally clears. And those toxins, such as ammonia, build up in the system. That leads to less responsiveness and sometimes even to being uh, comatose because of all of the toxins that are in the body. So all the major organs are shutting down. Mm. Now, as we increase the number of organs that are shutting down, the likelihood of improvement drops dramatically. Um, the increase, the mortality increases dramatically. So with sepsis and septic shock, um, the mortality for an average person is upwards of 40%. Um, with respect to the elderly, two-thirds of the elderly um, have have had have incurred sepsis and that's for the individuals over the age of 65 their mortality rates are much higher they can be upwards of 60 percent especially if they're um, developing septic shock so the mortality rates in the elderly patients are up to 1.5 times higher than in younger individuals and that relates to all this organ failure that's going on that cannot be that cannot sustain normal function, and then you start having to um, put the patient on dialysis, um, put them on a ventilator with a tube in their in their throat so that we can help them with breathing because they're not breathing well for themselves, um, especially if they have pneumonia on top of everything else. Um, so we're doing a lot to support those organs and try to get them through this process. Uh, one thing that's very key in that treatment is early antibiotics. So as soon as we know that we're suspecting sepsis, we need to get antibiotics on board um, because we know that for every hour of delay in treatment of sepsis, the risk of death increases by 8%. So all of these things are trying to not only buy time, but keep those organs functioning so that they don't completely fail. Um, and that's kind of an overview picture of what happens as a person um, progresses from sepsis to septic shock. So of, of the treatments that you that you stated, like the dialysis, um, you know, the respirator, that kind of thing, is, is antibiotics, is that the principal uh, treatment that, that, you know, that's, that's going to probably be the same for everybody? You're going to get on massive amount of antibiotics to treat it? Absolutely. And what we do is... Um, we try to put on what's called broad spectrum antibiotics at the beginning until we know what kind of organism we're dealing with and then we can narrow those antibiotics down. But in everything that we use to treat sepsis, the number one thing that can actually reduce the possibility of death or the death rate in patients with sepsis are timely antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So those are very key, very important but it requires that someone recognize what's going on. And that is the crux of the problem. Individuals, the patients themselves, the families, the caregivers, they need to be on a high alert for diagnosing this. Uh, everybody needs to be able to understand what they're looking at and, and put the picture together and have concerns for sepsis because that's when people start with getting the treatment and getting the antibiotics on board. You mentioned that there are, are uh, different ways that somebody can become septic, uh, bacterial, um, fungi, uh, I guess maybe even viruses or, yeah. or, or you know, parasites, I, I assume. But what, what is the most common? Um, you know, it actually depends on the season. So if, if, it's, if it's flu season, that's what we're going to see more commonly. But um, we are exposed to bacterial elements day in and day out. And mm -hmm. if our immune systems are not able to combat them in their most, you know, um, easiest formats, um, it's going to be overwhelming for the body. So bacteria, we are in contact with them constantly. Viruses, they can kind of come and go depending on how the season is. 
and maybe what your kind of exposure is. So if you're an elderly patient and you are visiting your grandchildren, you know, children tend to have more viral illnesses um, as they're growing older. And so depends on what, what type of season we're in, what your exposure is, and what your immune system is like. And for certain individuals, that means that they will have a higher likelihood of bacterial infections. For others, it would mean because of their contacts and things like that, that they may actually have more likelihood of viral infections. Mm. Um, so, so we can actually expect that um, when a patient has sepsis, we're going to need to investigate for all of them because it certainly could be any one of those. Right. That's actually a great segue, uh, Dr. Malik. So what what can you, what are the top tips to prevent sepsis that you would give to um, the average family member who has a loved one in a nursing home that's the senior citizen? Sure. So, you know, one of the things is that older individuals may actually be resistant to getting urgent medical care, but it's really imperative to get timely medical treatment in those patients in order to improve survival. As I mentioned, for every hour delay in appropriate antibiotic treatment, the risk of death increases by 8%. So it really bears repeating over and over that the best way to combat sepsis is to prevent it. And so families and caregivers definitely can play an extremely important role in prevention. Both the elderly and their caregivers should get appropriate vaccinations. They should pay very close attention to hand washing as well as wound care. And they should know the signs of sepsis, especially the signs that are common in the elderly, such as lower mental status um, as being one of the first signs. And finally, as I said previously, they should seek care and treatment as early as possible when there's a concern for sepsis. Um, And I also think that um, families and caregivers should be empowered to say the words, I think I may have sepsis, because it really puts a red flag up. It really gets the medical teams on high alert when someone is using that terminology. Um, In the UK, the UK Sepsis Trust, they have been advertising, you know, on ambulance doors and things like that. And those advertisements say, you know, think sepsis, say sepsis, so that we're having this conversation about something that's just beyond, I think I have a cut, I may have an infection. We're talking about sepsis because there are signs that show us that things have progressed, and we need to be able to say those words. Um, so, Dr. Malik, can you tell us to walk us through the Global Sepsis Alliance? Um, when did they form? What do they do? Um, how can people get in touch to get information about sepsis? Absolutely. So, the Global Sepsis Alliance started in 2012 as an organism, sorry, an organization mm-hmm. that um, was very interested in bringing awareness the to the healthcare workers but also to the general public about sepsis and improving everyone's knowledge about it but also then the outcomes it, the global sepsis alliance website um, has excellent resources and tools to help identify sepsis and for bringing awareness to the general public so i would absolutely recommend um, that if the listeners are interested in finding more about sepsis, that would be an excellent source um, for information. Now, that's an international organization of, of experts throughout the world. We also have um, nationally the Sepsis Alliance at sepsis.org, and they have a tremendous amount of resources online as well. Um, from my institution at MD Anderson, we have posted um, and published um, um articles on our online CancerWise blog post, there are several um, videos on YouTube, and MD Anderson, my organization, has put together one called What is Sepsis, which goes through a lot of this um, education, and basic education about sepsis, but it also shares patient stories along the way as well. And finally, related to what we're talking about today, the Alliance for Aging Research. They have a wonderful pocket film called Sepsis in Older Americans, Saving Lives Through Early Detection. And I think it really hones in on a lot of the points that we were talking about today. And I was very honored to be able to work with them on helping to create that pocket film. I think it's very relevant for the older Americans um, nursing home patients as well. 
Well, great. Um, well, Dr. Malik, this has been extremely informative. Um, I think we've, we've learned a lot. I think our audience has learned a lot. Um, if anybody has any questions, is there a way that they can reach out to you specifically? Or, I mean, is it reaching out to, to your organization? Is that, is that good? Or how, how do, how do we, how do they get involved? Oh, absolutely. Um, please, uh, feel free to email me. Um, it's I M A L I K at mdanderson.org um, or find me through the MD Anderson um, website, uh, Imran Malik. Excellent. I, I encourage everybody in the audience to go to YouTube and, and check those videos that, videos out that she was talking about because they're really good, concise, yeah. you know, uh, um, informative, informative yeah. places to get this stuff. But Because um, this is a bigger issue than people realize. Absolutely. Um, it's, like you said, the number one cause of death from infection, and I don't think that people understand that. Um, in our research for this, we discovered that um, it was a big deal, I guess, in World War II, and there's even some some interesting propaganda um, uh, fo- uh, posters that America made on trying to combat sepsis or blood poisoning, as they called it back then. Um, but yeah, people need to learn a lot more about this. Absolutely, and I think you know when we say that it's the number one cause of death from infections, that's a worldwide number that's in that's number one worldwide that's yeah. insane yeah. that is uh, mm-hmm. amazing well dr malik again thank you so much for being on the program i think we we'd love to have you on an, on a future program to, to go a little bit more in depth and and in you know into sepsis and and your organization but um we and thank, thank you for what you do yeah, absolutely absolutely thank you very much and i'm uh, very happy to join you all and i think this is such a wonderful way to get the message out and get the information out and um, I look forward to working with you guys in the future. Great. Absolutely. Thanks Thank you so Doc. much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Um, yeah. Se- I don't think sepsis is like an – I mean, I'm not trying to do a Donald Trump, but I think I don't think that sepsis is something that's very well known. Like a lot of people are not talking about sepsis. Uh, what I want to show, and, and maybe Gene can do this, is this um, – this, this, <laughs> poster from um world war ii it's a it's an american poster or it could possibly be english um and it's um it's about hitler's greatest ally um and it says that he uses blitz methods and it's it's blood poisoning so basically the purpose of this poster and you you should be able to see it right now gene's doing the right thing is that um, when you get a cut, or if you're in the field and you get a cut, if you're you know in in combat, um, you get a cut. You need to attend to it immediately, uh, because if you don't do that, there's always a chance that you're going to get an infection, and that infection becomes septic. And I and I suppose I mean if you got to you got to think about it. If if sepsis is the number one killer of of people with infections, that it's a big deal if you know. If you have a large contingent of, of troops and they're getting cuts, they're getting infections, maybe they're tired and their bodies run down. Um, but blood poisoning, as they used to call it, that's the old term for it, uh, blood poisoning, septicemia, sepsis, it's, it, it's, it's really a serious issue uh, and more so than I think people think. So it's it was good to have somebody like uh, Dr. Malik on today. Yeah. You can definitely say that sepsis is is no one's friend. That's you could say that. Yeah, that's a that's a, a definitely good way to put it. Yeah, because uh, and I say that only because today, July thirtieth, uh, is International Day of Friendship. I don't okay. know why we bring these things up, but I think it's funny. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I forgot to look at the paper on what the um what the what issue the, was what yeah. the special holiday is, but it is the International Day of Friendship. I don't again I don't know what that means, but I'm sure it's nice. Um, at any rate, again, thanks to the team for putting this podcast together, and thank you, uh, dear uh, audience, for watching or listening or reading or reading or reading the transcript. Yeah. So there's lots of ways to to listen every week um you can watch us nursing on bbs podcast.com or the youtube channel you can download the audio on stitcher itunes spotify or podcast puppy wherever you get your podcast from and you or you can read the you transcript can read you can read the transcript you can go, you to, go the to the website and read it and read it anyway um with that we will see you next time see you next time
Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Nothing said on this podcast, either by the hosts or the guests, should be construed as legal advice, nor is intended to create an attorney-client relationship between the hosts or their guests and the listener. New episodes are available every Monday on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube and our website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.